Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we're joined by senior economic journalist Anandya Chakravarti, and we're going to be talking about both 2020, the year that passed, and 2021, the year that's coming up, especially the economic scenario, which has really not been a lot of good news as far as the country is concerned. Anandya, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. So uh, we've talked about this over the many weeks in this past year, and it's in some ways it's almost it's almost a cliche, a common knowledge to say that the economy is bad across the world. But yes. In India's case, it seems especially, uh, say, dire because, of course, uh, like you talked about earlier, many of these indicators were already bad. So what the pandemic has done is made it worse, of course. And I suspect, as opposed to many of the other countries, especially in the region, which are likely to see, uh, once the crisis kind of abates, some sort of growth and some sort of uh, general, say, increase in demand, India does not seem to be going there. So maybe first, could you talk about this scenario in terms of why, even if the number of cases comes down and we have some sort of, medically, we are kind of covered, the economy is still going to be in danger. Well, you know, Prashant, as you know, that uh, since the, I, I think for, a, for several years now, India's economy has been doing very badly, right? And we've seen uh, accusations and allegations of data fudging. And it's very clear that the data itself is not very transparent that the government has been putting out about economic growth. And economic growth, we know when we, even if we look at all the high GDP growth years that we've had in the last so many years, let's say two decades or so, uh, we do know that even there, um, growth has actually been for just a very few people. Right? So even the high growth uh, 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 years of, let's say, the 2005 to 2008, 9, and even later due to government spending for a few years, um, then we know that there have been two kinds of things. Consumption by the affluent middle class, the upper middle class, and uh, a certain kind of demonstration effect for the poor, especially those who are directly in contract with the uh, upper middle class. And... Uh, investment which was entirely driven by debt and we know what that has caused in the market so we right. saw very high investment to gdp ratios earlier right close to 30 percent uh, but that was fueled by debt that was being put into things which later on we knew had no demand no money at all i mean you were putting huge amounts of money into the power sector and expecting to people to pay 15 rupees a unit right, right? You were putting huge amounts of money in construction, in toll roads, expecting people to pay toll. And obviously, none of that actually worked out. Or even this uh, very ridiculous real estate boom that we saw in the, uh, in the 2000s, uh, which uh, we know was unsustainable because it expected almost every Indian to be able to pay one to two crore rupees to buy a house. Right? Right. So it, it was quite ridiculous in India. What has happened of late uh, Prashant, and I think we've discussed this in the past, is that since 2011-12, we've seen the middle class essentially gradually um, facing problems. And we saw them suddenly being very concerned about corruption, for instance, right? Everything that they'd gained from all these right. years, right. suddenly they got very <laughs> concerned about corruption and they came out on the road supporting Anna and Nolan and all that. Oh, right. And uh, they said that corruption is the biggest problem in this country. We need a clean prime minister. And we saw uh, Narendra Modi come in with the promise of Achedin. And we know that the Achedin has uh, now, the only Achedin is for those who believe that Achedin means Ram Mandir and mm -hmm. Article 370 being, right. for them there has been Achedin. Mm -hmm. But for the rest, when it comes to material conditions, there is no Achedin. Mm -hmm. So the middle class, let me start with the middle class because I think the middle class is something that we don't talk about. And uh, the middle class has had a terrible time. In the past one year, it's been terrible. And actually, this has been before uh, COVID itself. Because let's take the CMIE data, right? Because the government doesn't produce any good, reliable Sorry. employment data. CMIE, and I think it was in alliance with BSE at some point, it started doing these weekly surveys and putting out that data. So at least there's a consistency. There's a like-to-like uh, -like comparison there. And let's take something that the middle class has always wanted, which is salary job. And uh, I'll come to that salary jobs aspect later. If I look at the average number of salary jobs in 2016, when CMI started collecting this data and compare it to what it was in 2019, right. before COVID, right? 
then we know that the average the number of salary jobs actually declined by 3% between 2016 and 2019 so you can't you can't really blame covid for that decline mm -hmm. and what happened in terms of job seekers job seekers would have gone up by a percent every year so the actual gap is actually of 5-6% in terms of jobs that were available in 2016 and are not available anymore. And this is salary jobs, which is what everyone wants because it's stable. You get a salary at the end of the month. Now, what happened in COVID? What happened in COVID was that the immediate impact was obviously on daily wages and what is called small traders, right? right. Uh, those who are on the roadside selling you bananda and chai and then <laughs> you know, doing various kinds of itinerant jobs. They were completely uh, badly hit by the lockdown. And then they recovered because they have to earn. Right? They can't sit at home. Right. They, lockdown has no meaning for them. They have to go out or just to survive. Now, uh, the second big hit, which uh, CMI came out with the data in August, was salary jobs. So I just took a look at the latest uh, data that we have from CMI for November. And compared to... Uh, 2019 average, right? The number of salary jobs in India is down by 21%, which suggests that out of every 100 people, every 100 people who had salaried jobs in 2019, 21 don't have it anymore, okay? And this is not just the bottom lot. We know that this has happened actually across the board, mm -hmm. right at the top as well. Even right. well-paid jobs are gone, right? And what is more likely is that the decline is actually probably closer to 30%. And maybe some parts have been hired. What happens? That you pay someone at a senior level a lakh a month and you find this is a good opportunity to get rid of them because you know that some of the salary gains that they've had is just seniority, right? It's just increments that they get while doing more or less the same work. Exactly. And you can replace them with someone who actually you'll pay 40,000 rupees, a younger person, maybe not experienced, but when the market is so bad, what are you going to do with experience? Right? So you get someone, a 25-year-old to replace a 45, 50-year-old person. So someone who was earning 1 lakh, you replace with 40,000. So I think even that has gone down. A large number of people have lost their jobs at that level and some have got replaced. So I wouldn't be surprised if out of the affluent middle class who were salaried, at least 20 to 25% have lost their job. I, would, I wouldn't be surprised by that number. That is a huge, huge impact when it comes to demand. Right. Absolutely. And we're also talking, for instance, about the other side, which is pay cuts as well. And the kind of impact it has on savings because the, those numbers could be as much, if not Yes. Higher. In fact, there is a, a new survey by uh, an agency called uh, Local Circles. I think they do bi biannual surveys on consumer what they call the mood of the consumer survey. They do it twice a year. Hmm. Their latest survey, which of course paints a slightly rosy picture claiming that people are now ready to buy, how that's possible because the rest of their data suggests that 68%, uh, if I'm not correct, uh, if I'm not wrong, 68% of their respondents said that their uh, savings have gone down this year. Right? The savings have gone down this year, not because they for various reasons, because they had to dip into their savings to run their families. So there are three reasons that to, uh, this local circles gives. One is, as you said, people have lost their jobs. The second is there have been uh, big pay cuts and uh, which have not been fully reinstated in most industries. And finally, in many cases, salaries were paid very late. So people were told that you will get a salary, but we have a cash flow issue. So please wait, we'll pay you uh, slightly later. I mean, I, I as a consultant, uh, used to do, uh, um, you know, some work for a big uh, news organization. And in April, they actually requested me and said that, can you take it in two parts? This is a big entity. Right. And I'm not talking about NDTV, where, I, of course, I used to work, but this is a newspaper which said that, can you take your money with you in two parts because we have a cash flow issue, right? So uh, there were delays in salary payments and people dipped into their savings and uh, that is what has happened. Absolutely. Right. So this context, like again, it's an issue we talked about earlier as well, but what we see is because of this automatically consumption declines and then there's this complete slowing down of the entire 
uh, economy, the whole, you know, there's generally no real will to buy. It's more in terms of a conservative attitude towards spending as well. Obviously, no vacations, which may have worked out. Yeah, no for the middle class. Like yes. out, for the middle class, it's worked out. Class, but yeah. you see, there's a big industry yeah. which depends on tourism. They have been badly. Exactly. And there is a part they of middle badly. class there as well, which would have been hit. Uh, but, exactly. uh, yeah. you know, I'm reminded of what P. Sainath said when he was addressing uh, students in JNU, right after, uh, you know, when Kanaya Kumar and Omar Khalid then, uh, uh, yeah, when that entire yeah. Z uh, fake news thing happened, right? And uh, um, P. Sainath came and he was addressing students and I think he started by saying, welcome to the rest of India, right? <laughs> what he meant was that the rest of India has never seen democracy. I mean, right. people, if they say something will be picked up, the police can come and pick you up anytime they want. If you don't pay your loan back in time, your land will be taken away. Your tractor will be taken away. Uh, microfinance companies might come and beat you up for all you know. They, and even the sense of free speech does not agree, exist for most of right. India. So the rest of right. India, that's it. And therefore, uh, Prashant, I'd say that for the middle class, it is a bit of a welcome to the rest of India. This has been welcome to the rest of India. That is what it is. Right. Because the rest of India has been doing badly for the last 35 years. Right? And all kinds of data fudging, fake, uh, you know, looking at uh, uh, calorific values set in sometime uh, 40 years ago and then adjusting it by a um, mm -hmm. index of inflation and saying so many people are poor, have come out of poverty. We know this is all, this is all poppycock, right? Correct. People have become right. poorer. There's higher degree of malnutrition, more hunger. Is stunting amongst children. We know all these things cannot happen if people become more affluent. And that is, Absolutely. we know that a per capita consumption of almost everything other than I think eggs has gone down for Indians mm -hmm. since liberalization does not improve. And that yeah. means, and that is despite the fact that people like you, you and I have been consuming even more than we were in the 80s. I don't know whether you were born in the 80s, but at least <laughs> I was. <laughs> Somewhere in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I was at least consuming, um, I can, and we were, we are consuming much more even in terms Absolutely. of feed and fodder, right? Hmm. So a lot of the uh, gr out, grain uh, output actually is not just eaten by human beings. So our consumption of meats and stuff might have increased, whereas the poor have actually got, got even worse. So the point is for the middle class, India's entire development strategy since the mid 80s has been to pander to a middle class consumption, mm -hmm. right? And growth, when we look at it, is entirely that, right? There's hardly anything captured outside that. The GDP numbers hardly are just estimates, right? 75% right? right. of manufacturing is essentially just a few listed companies, their right. profit, right? right? Value added. And then rest are estimates. And then there's a certain amount captured in agriculture. We know how badly agriculture has done in the last 30 years. Right? Mm -hmm. Devinder right. Sharma estimates that there's been hardly any real income growth Absolutely. for farmers in the last 30 years, whereas the right. rest of India has grown in real terms. And just look at India's GDP. It's been growing on an, let's say, even conservative term, 6% on an average for the right. last 30 years, right? 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 And uh, uh, and despite, and that is real, that's not nominal, that's real GDP growth. So technically, everyone's income should have increased by that much. But farmers, we know, have been stagnant. Workers, we know, are probably worse off. EPW uh, studies show to us that workers, in terms of their share of wages compared to productivity, is worse now than it was in the 80s. Right. So the rest of India has been doing badly. Finally, it has caught up with the middle class. The middle class and, and I think one of the things that the middle class, the problem the middle class now has is that it essentially has absolutely no uh, political, political voice. Political points as well. As well. <laughs> it doesn't. Have. It just controlled every institution so it could have done whatever it wanted. Mm -hmm. Now, it also knows, you know, just pandering to the middle class is not going to get you votes. Right? And this government, this dispensation, this Modi, Shah, BJP knows that. So, and they count on the fact that how, you know, a large part of this middle class, especially the mercantile classes, are happy if you give them a bit of interest. Right. Right. How long that will last, I don't know, but nevertheless. So their aim is to get money from that 0.1% top, keep them happy, create monopoly capital, 
and there is a 30% in the bottom right don't give them jobs don't make them any, give them anything just give them basic elements of dole to keep their nose above the water that right. is the system they are in and it's going to show up in it's obviously showing up in G- gdp data for years now mm-hmm. however much you may fudge it and as you said consumption is going to be badly hit so right. But does that and, affect? And for some, sections of the middle class, there's always Hindutva as well too. Uh, yeah, like you exactly. Said, for, yeah, yeah. The, Achit Din is there for those who have won the Ram Mandir and are concerned Absolutely. about 370. Absolutely. Yeah, and and you see, uh, one of the processes that began in the mid 2000s, which is of a few corporates completely taking over right. all media, mainstream media, right? Huh. So today, mainstream media is a clo- is closely held by let's say five or six uh, corporates with uh, big external uh, interests outside the world of news media and they determine what is going to be who is going to be the person on tv whose uh, uh, byline will go on the front page whose opinion will be on the opinion pages so they control media completely in a very detailed manner so there's a manufacturing of content which has been taking Absolutely. place every every day every minute so the for the middle class to even realize that things are bad because they think it's not that difficult to uh, make the middle class feel that the problem is somewhere else. Exactly. Maybe that because too many people celebrate Christmas. <laughs> that is the problem. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So, so I think that broadly the middle class is in for trouble. And we are seeing that across the board. One of the things that is, I think we discussed last time as well, Prashant, is that uh, you know, from the mid eighties, I'll take my example, right? Uh, we used to live in a, a rented house with a garden, a reasonably big plot and somewhere in South Delhi. And then, in te- and uh, my parents used to pay 300 rupees a month, I think 330 rupees a month till 1985, 86. And, uh, when that 85, 80, 85, 86 boom started, the first real estate boom started. Right. The landlord who had always been quiet suddenly wanted to sell the house. Hmm. So my parents also had to look for a house. They also had to build their own house. So this is not a this is not an isolated case. I mean, across India, professional middle class people who were teachers, doctors, engineers, whatever, right. lawyers, broadly within a uh, you know within an income group which kept them reasonably okay, hmm. but with very few aspirations beyond right. that, hmm. right? And uh, they suddenly had to buy homes. There was a real estate boom. People who already had homes, they suddenly became very rich. Mm-hmm. Their property right. values increased. Absolutely. And that entire process began of Grammy Awards coming. I don't know if you, uh, by the time you were probably watching Grammy Awards was a regular feature, but Grammy Awards, Miss Universe, Miss World, <laughs> you know, Oscar Awards, right. uh, uh, these being projected live on right. t- broadcast live on TV was a big thing. Big, big thing. We had no access to Mm-hmm. the west other than that and suddenly i wanted to you know uh, make my hair like uh, <laughs> andrew ridgely and george michael right and, you know, they used to use something called the uh, hair mousse oh, okay. i i got to know that they use hair mousse to make this and i discovered that you could do the same with using vikko vajradanti <laughs> <laughs> not vajradanti vikko uh, turmeric cream <laughs> <Greek. laughs> and i spread, and also simco hair fixer which right. sick gentlemen used to fix their beard, right. you can get a wet look. <laughs> this is Jugaad before the days of all these things. Right. And I gave this information to many of my friends. Sadly, uh-huh. uh, some of them have turned bald prematurely. <laughs> and they blame me. But what I'm saying is that suddenly there was this idea that we as the middle class are going to live the lives of what people were living in Singapore. Right. We're talking about oh, Singapore is so great and India mm. has been held back by socialism mm. and stuff like that. Suddenly you come full circle because right. when you are the only people who earn and consume, at some point there'll be no one to buy your services or your products. Precisely. And that is what Precisely. the middle class today faces. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Anandya, for talking to us. Thanks a lot. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching this week. Thank <laughs> you.